So we are uh, running on borrow time right now. So uh, everyone does have a few uh, question cards in front of them. So maybe if we'll just go down the line, choose your best questions, and give us your thoughts. Um, and don't take that long. <laughs> well, I, I have uh, the good fortune of having the same question submitted by three different people. Um, and and I'm, I'm really happy that three people thought of this question because it does, in fact, represent an extremely important point which I had wanted to talk about and, and ended up not doing. In fact, I prepared an entire different presentation which did deal with this, uh, with this question. The question is, in effect, uh, isn't the, is or isn't the uh, nuclear issue a distraction posed by the Israelis from the Palestinian question, Palestinian issue? And uh, in my alternative presentation, which I, I do actually, I did write up, um, I make the point that not only is the, uh, the Israeli demonization of Iran, which has been going on now ever since the early 1990s, since 1993, beginning with the Rabin administration, Rabin government, uh, this demonization campaign, which has been continuous ever since then, uh, one of the themes of that demonization campaign has been uh, that, that Iran is an existential threat. That's one of the primary themes. An existential threat to Israel. Uh, to Israel. And that idea uh, has been propounded by every single Israeli government since Rabin. And at least um, on three occasions, Two of, who, two of which are associated with Mr. Netanyahu, uh, there is no question that uh, this, what, this argument was in large part to uh, indeed distract attention, to, uh, d distract attention from or to promote a policy toward the Palestinian issue. If you go back to the Rabin government, he actually created the idea of the existential threat to Israel from Iran in order to justify his policy of negotiations with the PLO, beginning in 1993. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things that I've learned about Rabin's policy is that he originally started talking about nuclear weapons, uh, the threat of nuclear weapons in the Middle East after he was elected in mid-1992, but he talked about Arab regimes particularly, of course, thinking of Iraq. He didn't talk about Iran. It was not until he actually met with Bill Clinton in late 1992 during Clinton's presidential campaign when Clinton apparently voiced the you know, very, very hard line toward Iran, which he believed would be popular with funders uh, who he was appealing to in the United States as the pro-Israel candidate. It was only after Clinton was elected that Rabin started talking about the threat, an existential threat from Iran. And so the point being that there is a, there's a reciprocal relationship here between the Israeli use of the, the, the threat from Iran, the existential threat from Iran politically, and their enablers in the United States. Uh, in, in this case, Clinton wanting to run as the pro-Israel candidate Again, uh, in order, presumably, although I can't document this, to, to make sure that he had very strong support uh, from uh, funders as well as, as uh, getting the Jewish vote. But uh, the, the, the point about Netanyahu is that on two occasions, he used the existential threat from Iran in order to ward off pressure from the United States to change his policy to become more forthcoming with regard to the Oslo process, the peace process. He started doing that in 1997, very explicitly. Uh, started talking about the existential threat precisely when he needed to prevent the Clinton administration from putting pressure on him or, or soften any diplomatic pressure from the Clinton administration <laughs> to carry out the agreements that had been already reached by the Israeli government with the Palestinians. So there's no question that that has been a fundamental policy of Israel, to use the Iranian threat, supposed Iranian threat, as a way of avoiding 
another justification for or way of avoiding uh, the uh, serious negotiations with uh, and accommodating the rights of the Palestinians. He, he did it again uh, in 2012, quite explicitly, when he started talking about Hamas equals Iran. It was a way of making his domestic problems with the Palestinians an issue of the threat from Iran, which of course by that time, as I talked about earlier, was a major uh, success that Israel had uh, been able to achieve politically and diplomatically to create this idea of Iran as a nuclear threat. Okay, we can, uh, I have a, a couple of questions that I'm just gonna fly through here very quickly. Fortunately, sometimes you get duplicates, as, <laughs> as Gareth pointed out. So we'll start with the duplicate question. Uh, today's Washington Post indicates that Iran will not agree to or sign a deal unless all sanctions are lifted. What's the prospect of lifting, um, what's the prospect of a final deal with Iran given Khamenei's denunciation today on the front page of the Washington Post? Um, I think there is an unfortunate propensity to take what the Supreme Leader says word for word at face value. Um, I think like any politician that gives a speech, you kind of have to delve in there uh, and connect the dots in terms of what he's saying with what's actually happening in the world. In the exact same speech, he said that if we resolve the nuclear issue, it could in fact allow for conversations with the United States on regional security issues, which is something that a lot of people in this town said he would never approve. So I do think that uh, he came out and, and said all sanctions should be lifted immediately. Uh, but I don't think that's his actual position. I think there is a bit of posturing, and I think that, that there is a bit, of, uh, a bit of spin going on. And I think the Iranians realize that it is not possible for American sanctions to be lifted upon signature of a, of a nuclear deal. Congress isn't going to do that. Uh, so I think that there's going to be a mutually acceptable process that's put into place where uh, it'll be step by step, it'll be based on reciprocity, and it will be decided in advance the steps that the P5 plus one and Iran will take at the same time, you know, tit for tat, who gets what when, that will all be sorted out in, in due course. Don't get me wrong, there will be a lot of haggling over this particular point between now and the end of June, uh, when a final deal is supposed to get done. There'll be a lot of brinkmanship but I don't think that it's going to be an insurmountable obstacle by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, because if nothing else, it's important to remember that every single compromise, concession, call it what you will, that the Iranians have made up to this point in these negotiations was approved in advance by the Supreme Leader. The Iranian negotiators are not freelancing. They're running everything by the Supreme Leader. And Foreign Minister Javad Zarif is the Supreme Leader's personal rep at these negotiations. So I think we're in good shape when it comes to that particular point. Um, next question, any chance that major powers will demand the same monitoring controls for Israeli nuclear industry? Double standards is a major problem. No, no, that's, that's unfortunately not going to happen. Um, not that I don't want it to happen. I, I think it would be great if it happened. I'm just being realistic, unfortunately. I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna see that anytime soon, but I, it, it should happen in, in my humble opinion. Um, next question, you said that nothing in the Middle East is separate despite nearly seven decades of suffering human rights violations. Palestine was never able to get the U.S. to stand up to Israel. Why do you think the U.S. has been unwilling to talk to, uh, has been more willing, excuse me, to talk to and negotiate with Iran? Um, I think it, it, it became an issue of war and peace. Uh, as it relates to Iran, and a, and, a, and a cycle of mutual escalation where, you know, sanctions, cyber warfare, secret assassinations on our side, and then Iranian bombing campaigns against Israelis around the world, systematically advancing the technical aspects of their nuclear program, 20,000 centrifuges uh, from over the past 10 to 15 years. Both sides were running out of escalatory options that were short of what would essentially be a trip-wired war. So it was kind of like those old James Dean movies where the two cars are driving towards the end of the cliff, playing a game of chicken to see who will pump on the brakes first. Fortunately, they both hit the brakes at the same time. And that's, and, and that's luck. I don't even believe in luck. I think luck is for losers. But frankly, we got lucky, OK? This was not a strategic decision on the part of the United States or the Iranians. It was just cooler heads prevailed. And that doesn't happen often when we're talking about our world more generally or the Middle East more specifically, which is why I'm calling it blind luck. Um, 
as it pertains to mistreatment of Palestinians and America's unwillingness to stand up to Israel. I think it was Harry Truman that once said that um, uh, he, he compared the amount of Zionists that he has as constituents versus the lack of Arabs that he has as constituents. I don't remember the exact quote, but the reality of the situation is that domestic political constraints in the United States have a propensity to dictate the positions that a lot of our elected officials take on this one very emotionally and politically charged issue. Um, love it or hate it, uh, Jewish Americans are extremely well organized politically in the United States of America. And until we have uh, equally organized minority groups that perhaps have a difference of opinion on how these policies should play out as it pertains to the United States involvement, I just don't see uh, a viable way uh, for this to shift. But the fact that you're all here right now, I think, speaks volumes to the fact that it is, in fact, possible. Uh, the last thing that I would say uh, as it relates to these questions, will the U.S. accept Iran's, uh, accept a deal with Iran unless all sanctions end? Uh, what about inspections of military installations? I think I covered the sanctions bit. They'll sort out a mutually acceptable way to get the sanctions terminated uh, and then uh, allow for the constraints on Iranian programs in a reciprocal manner. Uh, you don't get this far in the process to let it blow up over, over minutia. And it's not to say that the minutia is important, because the devil is definitely in the details, but I just don't think it, it, it blows up at this point. I think it's kind of like the banks in 2008. It's too big to fail. Um, inspections of military installations. Depends on what the military installation is. The International Atomic Energy Agency has had access to some military sites in the past. And if there is just cause to visit military sites in the future, I don't think that there will be a problem on the part of the Iranian end to allow those visits. But what I don't think the Iranians will agree to is allowing the IAEA to say, hey, you have a military site. We want to visit it. And the Iranians say, why? And then the IAEA says, because. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So I'd like to think that there is a, a gray area or a middle ground, if you will, that the two sides can agree on. And in fact, I think that they actually will end up agreeing on a middle ground. Because again, the amount of compromises and concessions that both sides have made at this point are so massive that to backtrack and to let it fall apart now would be a, a failure of epic proportions. All of the questions I were given are basically on the same topic. Um, and to uh, quote one of the cards, why does no one bring up, one, Israel's nuclear program, two, the fact that Israel has not been inspected by the IEA, and three, that Israel has never signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, the U.S. government, uh, as a matter of policy, has never um, pronounced on this topic, I will follow the prescribed rules and refer to Israel's widely suspected nuclear <laughs> weapons article, uh, arsenal. Um, uh, if the writings of Abner Cohen, who is the uh, foremost historian of Israel's widely suspected uh, uh, nuclear weapons program, he's written a couple of books on the subject, um, has, among others, described uh, the origins of this. Goes, goes back to the time of Richard Nixon and Golda Meir uh, in the earliest phases of the is Israel's widely suspected program, <laughs> in which the basic deal that was struck uh, was that um, the U.S. government would not make a stink about the program as long as the Israelis uh, did not publicly acknowledge it and thus make it a huge foreign policy problem for the Nixon administration. And that's been the, continued to be the policy through uh, several administrations, and I think just through longevity and the fact that it has gone through several Republican and Democratic administrations, for the U.S. to depart from that policy would be seen, seen as a huge step. Uh, it would be seen as, uh, by would-be supporters of Israel in this country as a, uh, I mean, the, 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 of, of the ilk that we're talking about in this conference, um, uh, a big blow against uh, Israel and a, uh, a huge compromise to the special relationship. You certainly won't get any argument from me that it would be very wise to take that step. Um, and indeed, Abner Cohen, uh, he had an article in Foreign Affairs a while back, and uh, the other scholars have made this point, that from Israel's own standpoint, it would make sense to bring their widely suspected program out of the closet. Uh, among other things, it would enable more open and worthwhile uh, talks uh, between uh, U.S. and Israeli officials about security cooperation, you know, that really matters, that sort of thing. But like Reza, I don't, um, I don't expect this is going to happen anytime soon. I would not rule it out entirely if uh, over the next two years um, 
uh, in response to Israeli government uh, continued attempts to do everything it can to sabotage and defeat the nuclear agreement if the Obama administration in its closing months really wanted to play hardball, uh, this is one thing they could have on their list of options uh, to finally change the policy that Nixon set uh, over 40 years ago. Um, but again, I'm not going to hold my breath. All righty, so this has been an exciting panel and a good way to end our day today. If everyone could just remain seated for a few seconds. Delinda Hanley and Grant Smith have some final right, thoughts. We've got a half-hour recap. No. <laughs> we just wanted to thank everybody, myself on, on, on part of IRMEP. Please come and visit our website and sign up for our email list. And we hope that uh, you fill out the survey, which is coming your way, uh, probably next week. Thank you. And we really thank you for joining us as we examined the knot that binds or even strangles the United States and Israel. Um, let's continue to work together to untie this knot, improve our nation's policies, and align them more with American core values. And I really want to give a shout out to Grant, who has been working, his whole family has been working this for months. <laughs> No one could do a conference without this man. And keep your eye on the Institute on for Research and Middle East Policy. Thanks, everybody.